global leaders gathered in New York to make the world a better place. There is much work to be done. Amid doubts about its own relevance, can the UN keep the peace? Can it keep its promises and commitments? With 192 independent member states. Together, we can and must do better. What will it take to reform and reinvigorate the United Nations? Or is it time to say goodbye? This is Empire. Hello and welcome to Empire. The United Nations General Assembly has opened its 65th session right across the street in the shadow of mounting questions about its credibility, efficiency, accountability, and leadership. Many would like to see the UN reformed, and a growing minority would like to see it replaced, or at least bypassed, by smaller, more effective international organizations. And yet the UN is uniquely positioned to initiate and manage international humanitarian efforts and campaigns, such as the Millennium Development Goals to eradicate poverty and disease, among others. But like the last conference on climate change, countless debates on nuclear proliferation, arms race, international terrorism, and other global contentious issues tend to culminate in little consensus, and when they do, produce modest or no serious results. 65 years after its birth, the UN is facing a crisis of identity. Together, we can and must do better. Time to make this institution more accountable. The UN should be ashamed of itself. In a world more fractured and fractious than ever before, is the UN fit for purpose? At a cost of $2 billion a year, is the UN's General Assembly just the world's most expensive chat room, President, the a 21st century Tower of Babel. Talking is the one asset they have. The only way we seem to be able to make decisions is uh, putting together 192 uh, separate entities and hoping for the best. And this year was no different. When it comes to actionable decisions, the real power lies with the Security Council, still completely controlled by the so-called five great powers, America, Britain, France, Russia, and China. There is probably no institution that is more behind the times than the Security Council. Set up in 1945 to reflect that world, it obviously doesn't reflect today's world. They pick who qualifies for UN intervention, they issue resolutions, and they impose sanctions, and they get to choose who gets a free pass. Efforts to chip away at Israel's legitimacy will only be met by the unshakable opposition of the United States. Israel's illegal occupation of Palestine still unresolved, despite 225 UN resolutions calling for a just peace. There's been a lot of uh, anger and resentment, particularly at the role of the United States, um, which has, particularly since the early 1970s, emerged as basically the defender of Israel on the Council. Instead, the five once great powers have focused UN interventions in areas close to their own hearts. Leaving Saddam Hussein in possession of weapons of mass destruction for a few more months or years is not an option. And downplayed the priorities of the developing nations. There's a desire on the part of a group of states to take certain threats to security seriously. Terrorism, nuclear weapons, and a desire on the part of another group of states to say, okay, our security issues are the issues that emerge out of extreme poverty and underdevelopment. And that gap has not been bridged. This year, UN members revisited their pledge to eradicate poverty, end hunger, and treat HIV. But the rich nations have their own economic problems. We should not balance budget on the backs of the poor. The UN has undertaken dozens of peacekeeping missions since its inception, but it has not had a happy history. Today, 
the UN is involved in peacekeeping missions all over the world, but still, its actions often fail to live up to its promises. From Lebanon to the Democratic Republic of Congo, then there is Sudan's President Omar al-Bashir has been indicted by the UN-supported International Criminal Court for multiple war crimes and crimes against humanity in Darfur and northern Sudan. Getting the indictment and now an arrest warrant for Bashir when no one was going to enforce that does not really get us very far. While other despots and leaders of great powers who support them are accorded all the trappings of international statesmen. If you are sitting in that part of the world, you are looking at a set of activities around international criminal justice which seem to be directed at one part of the world. That is a huge problem, I would say, for the legitimacy of an institution that purports to be global. Now the UN is facing a crisis of confidence from within. This summer's damning internal report concluded that the UN is in a process of decline. When the Beatles ask uh, who will need me, who will feed me when I'm 64, we're now into the 65th year. And um, it seems to me that the United Nations is more and more necessary and it's farther and farther away from where the action is. But for all the UN's failures, the paradox is that since its founding, it has prevented the world from tipping over the brink to World War III and not even its critics can imagine what the world would look like without it. Joining me to discuss the role of the UN and its relevance in ever-changing worlds are Ambassador Thomas Seltzer, Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination and Interagency Affairs, Philip Bobbitt, Law Professor at Columbia University and author of numerous books including Terror and Consent, The Wars for the 20th Century, and last but not least, Ambassador Lakdar Brahimi, the author of The Brahimi Report on the UN Peacekeeping Operations, former Special Advisor to the Secretary General, Head of the UN Mission in Afghanistan from 2001 to 2004, and Special Envoy to Iraq, Haiti, etc., etc. Gentlemen, welcome to Empire. Thank Ambassador you. Seltzer, let me start with you. On top of the UN agenda this year was the Millennium Development Goals. Are you on track to eradicate poverty, take care of diseases, and so on and so forth? You know, the NDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, were defined and agreed upon by the whole UN community, the global community, in 2000. So it was signed by everyone? Everybody was on board. Signed on. So but there's, there's a lot advantage. of pessimism out there, Ambassador, that perhaps it's, uh, it's far-fetched, that nearly most of the African nation, for example, will not reach most of those goals. Well, the picture after 10 years is very uneven. You know, but it's always, you know, how do you look at the glass? Is it half, is it half full or half empty? We have a lot of success stories, but we have a lot of gaps. There's no doubt about that. You know, we are proceeding pretty well in supplying clean water to the world. So this yeah. is one of the, of the uh, goals we are well on track, of providing primary education. Here we are also pretty much on track. But on you know, other for goals, example, take the primary education. The United Nations have vowed, you know, back in 1960, that by 1980, all elementary, uh, all elementary uh, schools will be filled by all the young students, but of yeah. course it never happened. Well, it, 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 because it didn't happen, we decided on the MDGs. So it became one of the main goals of the Millennium Development Goals to do provide uh, primary education. And here we have made a big uh, step forward. Ambassador Brahimi, I wonder, when, when we call them goals and not benchmarks, mm. is this less committal? You know, the United Nations is first and foremost its members. Yes. It's not this building or, or the Secretary General. And when the members get together, they set for themselves goals. Right. Whether they, they, first of all, whether they mean it or not. Uh, that's, that's the first question. Do they mean it? Um, no, not all of them and not really. The second thing is how much they do to achieve those goals. Uh, but I think it's very good that you have this organization where people come, get together, discuss the problems that are there, and try to achieve them. But there's a certain megalomania about it all. They always tend to send these huge plans, huge projects. Climate change, 
it didn't work really last year, did it, most of them? Yeah. Now they want to eradicate this and that, poverty, disease, no. uh, it's, these are illiteracy. Not, these are not unachievable goals. They are all achievable. The problem is that, you see, we haven't reached the stage where the international community, the, the system of international cooperation is so beautifully oiled that it works very well and that you know, political uh, will is there and that everybody does what they say they are going to do and so on and so forth. But you know, I think we do achieve quite a few things uh, and uh, you know, these commitments uh, quite often are surprisingly successful. When you see, for example, these diseases that have been eradicated, that's not bad. But if you look again, you know, all over the world, people live much longer than they used to. What do you think, uh, Professor Babit? You were, uh, or you are a bit suspicious about the whole idea of the international system and so on and so forth. Do you think the UN has an, has an indispensable role, if you were to take care of those sort of humanitarian, big issues, global challenges? I do, and I, and I think that this last week, in many ways, has been quite encouraging, because it would have been very easy for states to say, look, we've just gone through the worst credit crisis since the Depression. We're going, to, we're going to scale back these goals. But instead, they sort of doubled down and said, we're, we're committing ourselves, uh, we're renewing our commitment. So I found that I found it rather encouraging. You know, another big theme of this, of this summit was compliance with commitments. The gap between commitment and delivery uh, is huge. And how to close this gap? This is something the United Nations has a role to play. If you want us to help you implement the goals, you need to give us the financial means to proceed. Yeah, but let's be self-critical a little bit here. Yes, uh, the, the commitment is not enough. The delivery of the cash that has been promised very seldom uh, uh, happens. But also, let us recognize that there is a lot of waste. Yes. And, and that, you know, the United Nations, the people who work for it, the United Nations organizations, the, the um, uh, you know, the, the, the countries where this aid goes have a share of the responsibility about that waste. We're going to get to the question of mm. uh, accountability and so on and so forth. Yes. That you, but before yes. we do that, uh, Professor Robert, you're pretty keen on, on the importance of the role of, for example, the United States in all of these endeavors. But take, for example, uh, its last pledge. President Obama pledged $64 billion to take care of the health questions over the next six years. But when the New York Times did its investigation, it turned out that 33 billion of them have already been spent. Is there a problem of commitment on the part of rich countries? So much so that Secretary, General Secretary Ban Ki-moon would say, would warn the rich countries, don't balance your books on, our, on the backs of the poor. Well, I would just begin by saying that the U.S., as I understand it, is now current in our obligations to the U.N., and this is a very important step, I think, in the right Since the, the right Bush direction. years, anyway. Well, since the previous administration. Yeah. So I think the track record of U.S. commitment overall, if you sort of stand back, has really been pretty extraordinary over many decades. When he was here last, uh, last week, President Obama spoke about a reinvigorated peacekeeping uh, role for the United Nations. Before we discuss that, our uh, our colleague Seb Walker is the only journalist left in Haiti after uh, after the last disaster there. Prepared a special report for us about the UN in Haiti. Let's watch. On patrol with Brazilian forces in Port-au-Prince's poorest neighborhood, the sprawling slum of Cité Soleil is a red zone for many international aid workers. These soldiers, the most visible daily sign of the UN's presence here. For Captain Hercules Pedroza, the neighborhood's history of gang violence means that if his troops were to leave, chaos and lawlessness would take their place. It's an area we had to conquer with gunfire and blood. It wasn't easy. It's not my job to decide how much longer we have to stay here, but if we go now, there will be problems. I know that if we go now, the violence will rise again. Cité Soleil still bears scars from gun battles waged between UN troops and armed gangs when the soldiers first arrived after the coup ousting Haitian President Jean-Bertrand Aristide in 2004. No one knows exactly how many Haitian civilians were caught in the crossfire. Mercius Lubin and his wife Marie Danielle lost their two daughters 
when shooting erupted after their house was surrounded by UN troops late one night in 2007. They were sleeping when the bullets hit. We lost our two angels and we'll never get them back again. A UN investigation cleared the troops of any direct responsibility for the deaths. But there have been other complaints of human rights violations by UN forces over the years. And on the streets of Port-au-Prince, the perception at least of UN peacekeepers as an occupation force here on a pretext that without their presence, Haiti would descend into violence. You'd believe that we are savages, you know, just waiting to, to get into an orgy of violence. But the reality completely undermines this theory. Uh, remember, they were predicting that after the earthquake, all hell would break loose, and it never happened. When the 7.2 magnitude quake hit Haiti in January, burying hundreds of thousands of people under rubble, the UN's first response was to flood the streets with armed troops. Rather than search and rescue, the focus of UN peacekeepers in those early days appeared for the most part to be crowd control. And in devastated neighborhoods around the capital, it seemed Haitians were often left to fend for themselves in the aftermath of one of the worst disasters in modern history. Nearly nine months later, for many, not much has changed. At least 1.3 million people are still living in squalid camps, exposed to the elements, disease and hunger. Meanwhile, the latest UN budget request has risen to more than $800 million to fund extra troops to prevent political instability during election season. A cost Ban Ki-moon's representative in Haiti says is money well spent. Providing that kind of political and social stability so far has generated many other opportunities for Haitians in jobs, etc. And as I said before, everything was going quite well by the end of 2009, and then we had the earthquake. So we have to start, I mean, almost from zero again. But back in Cité Soleil, the benefits of having had a multi-billion dollar mission here for more than five years are hard to see. The lack of basic services, chronic child malnutrition, and a life expectancy of less than 50 years is a failure for which the UN must take its share of the blame. With world leaders in New York last week to discuss global problems at the UN's headquarters, helping Haiti was high on the agenda. But for residents of Cité Soleil, it didn't take an earthquake to show that what's been achieved so far simply isn't working. Ambassador Brahimi, you've written the corner reports on UN peacekeeping missions. Mm. That was back in 2000. Mm. You've been since then in Iraq, in Afghanistan, Haiti, and so on and so forth. What's your take? Haiti is, is, is a, you know, an extremely poor country, uh, very, very backward. We have promised much more than we can deliver. What has been done should not be underestimated. Dictatorship is gone, uh, the Duvaliers and Papa Doc and so on, that is, that is not there anymore. And I think, you know, people until this earthquake were not starving anymore. Uh, and the country was slowly uh, trying to stand up on its own. But do you think feet. peacekeeping are doing better than they did in earlier years? Oh, definitely. You don't think it's a bit too militarized no. in terms of its presence, at least in the no. case of Haiti? No, no. Sometimes you have too many troops and few, uh, fewer civilians than you need. Sometimes it's the opposite. That's because we, we very seldom know enough about the country where we are going. That one, mm -hmm. two, we promise much more than we can deliver. I think we would do much better if we really tell the people, look, you have a window of opportunity that the international community, for whatever reason, is interested in you. It's up to you to make the best of that opportunity. But it's not going to last. And it's, it's not going to deliver paradise on earth for you. Uh, and then I come back to the, uh, what I said a little bit earlier, the waste. We, we crowd over one another and we duplicate a lot of work and we waste a lot of resources yeah. that should go to... Uh, I, I think you said, Professor, that the United States have given, has given a lot of money. Absolutely. But I'm, I don't think we have used that money 
as efficiently as, as, as we were. And Ambassador Seltzer, in fact, there are many criticisms, including in the report, mm. about the UN not doing sufficient research and perhaps not having enough intelligence about what goes on in these hot spots in the world sure. in order mm. to better prepare for them. Well, if you look at Haiti, in this short period of the, when disaster was striking, we lost all our leadership in Haiti. Yeah. It was the That's biggest right the loss beginning. for the yeah. UN ever. So we had to, to, to bring in new decision makers, a whole new infrastructure. All the decision makers died in this earthquake. This is the one point. The second point is, if you look at these national disasters which happen worldwide, unfortunately the poorest countries are also the most vulnerable in the face of disasters. So the issue is, how can we make uh, Haiti stronger? How can we strengthen the base, the starting point, for a sustainable recovery. When a crisis occurs, a great humanitarian crisis occurs of the kinds we've seen in the last couple of years, it's way too late. The, the yeah. people who suffer most are those in such fragile structures that the, the UN has to play a decisive role. On the other hand, if you're trying to give us some cushion, some, some margin of error in these poor countries, then I think investment has to, has to precede aid. Almost but like the, a crisis prevention type of thing. But at the time of the crisis, it's, it's too late for investment then. Then you've got to have some emergency. Professor uh, Bobbitt, take a look at most of the, these peacekeeping operations. Haiti, Iraq, Afghanistan, Lebanon, Congo. A lot of them are in so many ways cleaning after colonial, post-colonial, or recent Western adventures in these countries. You're, you're hoping by that provocative remark to induce me to say something that's uh, a powerful rebuttal, but I suppose, uh, while I'm an historian and my PhD is in history, that I think we go from where we are. I, I think a, a, a divisive and ultimately unproductive uh, exercise to say that the UN is being used by history to repair the wrongs of the past. The UN is being used by its member states to try and uh, anticipate the crisis of the future. Yep. And Ambassador Brahimi, let's look at that. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, those countries, the United States, UK, Japan, mm -hmm. give about one third mm -hmm. of the budget of the peacekeeping missions. Mm -hmm. So at least they're doing their share on that. Sure. On the other hand, the countries who are all providing... The developed countries. All the developed yes. countries. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, those who are providing the troops mm -hmm. for the peacekeeping mm -hmm. force are Nepal, Pakistan, India, yeah. Egypt. Yeah. Those are already 40%. Yeah. So is this part, again, of the global system? The rich gives the money and the poor provides the human resource? There is indeed a tendency where the division of labor internationally is that the rich give money and the poor give blood. And I think this The rich is, give money and the poor give blood. Yeah. And I think this is not a good, uh, a good division of labor. Uh, and I, I don't think this is going to... Uh, you know, to help build the international community and the international peace that we all dream of. Uh, I, I think that the, the, the poor countries should give a little bit more money. And there are countries that are not that poor. For example, China. China, India, It doesn't Russia. give money, it doesn't give troops. Yeah. These countries should give a it's, little bit fact, more money. In fact, it's actually money. less than 2%, uh, Ambassador. China gives less than 2% of yeah, the... So that's, that's, that doesn't make sense. So Russia is not giving troops, China is not giving troops. And, these, are... and the, these countries who have money are not giving money either. Yeah. So on, on, on the side of the non-Western countries, they should give a little bit more money. But I think it is terribly important to have uh, also soldiers from the developed countries because they are much better equipped, they are much better trained. Yeah. And I think if they came in, perhaps we can do the job more economically. Well, I think it probably in. depends upon the task that the troops are asked to perform. Uh, right now, the United States has a million and a half persons under arms. Mm. We're in, involved yeah. in several combat theaters. Mm. So I don't think we can say that the Americans aren't contributing their share of blood to mm. the resolution of, of these conflicts. 
not in UN, not in UN mandated uh, missions. There are also peacekeeping troops provided by northern countries. You know, very Finland, few. Austria, very very. Uh, if, you see, these countries used to contribute a great deal. Sweden, Austria, Finland. Yes, but actually uh, today they're contributing they are also two percent. The crisis have shifted. Many of the of the action areas are now, for example, in Africa. And there's a strong tendency to employ African peacekeeping troops because they also speak the language. They also have a cultural affinity. So this is also a direction uh, going. It's the Security Council that gives these missions. Yeah. And especially the P5. They, they have the last word in, in saying where the United Nations should but go. They're not, gentlemen, but, but, we're going to yeah. need to take a news yeah. break. But when we come back, we will discuss the future of the UN in such a changing world, its mandates, and so on and so forth. But right after when we come back from the break. Welcome back. Many believe the UN is outdated and cannot meet the challenges of the 21st century, that it must reform to stay relevant in world affairs. They ask, if the UN boasts of promoting global governance, what about its own good governance? It polices the world hotspots, but who polices the UN's own fault lines and conflict of interests? Last year, much of the focus was on the need to reform the UN Security Council. This year, much of the criticism is directed at the lack of leadership and lack of new vision for the organization. Before I discuss with my guests the future of the United Nations, here is a quick look at the record of the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and that of his predecessors. In a world threatened by war, nuclear proliferation, and catastrophic climate change, the UN Secretary General stands as a voice of reason. The time for unreasonable Demands is over. But is this UN Secretary General too reasonable? The time for consensus has arrived. The Secretary General is himself the means by which that institution inserts itself in big issues. And Ban has been too modest a figure, too quiet a figure, too unwilling to ruffle any feathers. His leadership has been described at best as Ban Ki-moon has been far more explicit on Middle Eastern questions than, uh, than Kofi Annan ever was. I don't think he's done very well, but he's at least tried. And at worst... I would say out of 10, I would give Ban a 3. His predecessor, Kofi Annan, once quipped that his role as UN Secretary General, or SG, as it's commonly known, stood for scapegoat. He was probably pleased to hand over the baton. I already know 
that you have chosen well. Although he left his successor a very full in tray. Starting from Darfur to Middle East, Lebanon, Iran, Iraq, North Korea. Three years into his tenure, those challenges are still pending. The role of Secretary General was initially conceived as the world's moderator, but it's become more like that of a powerless bureaucrat. First of all, he's the chief clerk and bottle washer. The second role is as the world's chief diplomat. And then there's the other role uh, is the, the sort of secular pope of the world. It's somebody who radiates trust. You know, I represent the world and you trust us. The problem with that job is that uh, you have soft power of attracting people. You don't have much hard power. So you are more secretary than general. But were any of Ban's predecessors any better? Waldheim was the worst. I mean, he was the worst in the famous sense that it later turned out he was a member of this uh, Nazi paramilitary organization. Uh, of Paris de Cuellar was once said he was a man who couldn't cause a splash by falling out of a boat. That's kind of the archetypal UN Secretary General. The best was Doug Hammarskjöld, who by the end of his time had offended every single member of the Security Council. And so the figures they appointed after him, a series of other relatively modest figures, uh, they didn't rock the boat either. Until Boutrous Boutrous Ghali, who showed too much independence and was promptly shown the door. Ban's reign as Secretary General started with a bang, but he prefers a softly, softly approach. As Secretary General, I've tried to facilitate There are times when it is only by publicly holding someone to account that you can cause them to change. Quiet diplomacy won't work. Ban did criticize Israel. He even tried to get the border crossings into Gaza reopened. He attempted to negotiate a settlement to the violence in Sudan. This time is for action. Ban also tried to intervene in Sri Lanka, but the UN was relegated to a supporting role. Ban's answer was, I'm doing a lot behind the scenes that you don't know about. He was, but was it effective? No. It is so decided. Same thing happened with Copenhagen. Look at the outcome. Was Copenhagen, the successor to the Kyoto Treaty, a success? No, it was a failure. Even an inside report accused the UN under Ban's leadership of lacking accountability, good governance, and strong leadership. There have been a series of these kind of internal eruptions, which have been terribly embarrassing to Ban, a Norwegian diplomat, who basically wrote a letter, a, a diplomatic note back to her bosses saying this guy is useless. While Ban Ki-moon prefers a low-key approach. I'm making a list, checking it twice. Some of his public appearances have been, hmm, decidedly off-key. Ban Ki-moon is coming to town. He once said that his job was to change the UN and through it the world but he knew it wasn't going to be easy. It's just impossible. I need more political support. I need more resources support by the member state. Then judge my performance on the basis of that. Ambassador Seltzer, uh, perhaps it's not fair to ask of you since you are the Assistant Secretary General, but to your mind, how did the Secretary General do over the last uh, three years? Well, you can only assess a term after its end. Now, the Secretary General, you know, his approach to the personal style, you know, he's, uh, he, and he says this very often, uh, he prefers, you know, quiet diplomacy, uh, working with leaders behind the doors, which, from what I see, has been very efficient. And there has been very clear marks in his uh, few years that he has been in his position so far. He has strengthened the accountability system in the United Nations. And he has, he has also made the world aware of some of the issues which are relevant. For example, climate change. This is an issue that only that can only be uh, resolved uh, within a global community uh, as such. Because to to decide upon legally binding instruments right. uh, to resolve climate change, you need consensus of all the 192 member states. That's mainly attributed to the Secretary General and his untiring efforts to bring the world together. We can also talk about. You know, Copenhagen, what happened in Copenhagen, and what the consequences are for the United Nations, but this is not part of this question. Ambassador. You know, the first Secretary General, Trig Lee, resigned, gave up, 
after I think two or three years, saying this is an impossible job. Hammarskjöld, who succeeded him, has been an incredibly good secretary general. Because as we saw in the report, he upset everyone. Yeah, uh, great. You see, why not? You see, the, he set standards for the job that were extremely high. Mm. Uh, others, I think, tried to uh, to that. live up to, to to those standards. How do you think Ban Ki Moon did, Ambassador? Um, you know, I think the jury is still out. You know, mm. let's say. Uh, but what what I can see there now is that. Member states, you know, made Hammarskjöld's life extremely difficult, and he resisted that. I think after him, uh, people resist, I mean, secretary generals, all of them, resisted less. The important point is that the United Nations has lost a great deal of its credibility along the way, as an independent, uh, impartial, uh, even-handed organization. And this is, I think, bad for you know this uh, you know, the secretary and the secretary general and everybody else. What you're saying is mm. that the weakness of the secretary general and the secretariat is a symptom of a bigger problem that has to do with how this institution is losing its credibility yeah. slowly but surely. Rather than than speak of the weakness of the secretary general, say the the bullying of member states. Well, here you go, Professor yeah. Babe. It seems. For many, the Secretary General cannot be strong as long at least the, secure, the, the UN Security Council members do not want him to be strong. That there's a certain balance, or rather imbalance, that those members would like to see where they are the ones who dictate, not any one person or any one secretariat. Well, I think that's true, although I think that's slightly artificial because it suggests that the most influential UN members are on one side and the Secretary General is on the other side. But they are, aren't they? I, I reject the idea that they are necessarily at, at loggerheads. And I accept the idea that they function best when they are in, in unison. But it is true, Professor, that I think it's uh, our good friend Madeleine Albright who said we want the Secretary General to be more of a secretary and less of a general. <laughs> uh, I think this is a fact. But this is not bad, I think. This is public. It's not bad. They, no, and I think uh, it's, it's, it's not justified to speak of the weakness of the Secretary General. I think his great strength is bringing people together and interests together. He does that. If you look back here, the United Nations, you know, these two weeks, the leaders of 192 countries are coming together to lay out their national interests. A lot of people say it's a talk show. It's not interesting. But they better listen because if we want to, to define common solutions, we better are aware of each other's interests. This year, it might be a lot of focus about uh, the Secretary General, the Secretariat. But last year, I don't know if all of you were here, we've been bombarded by talk about reforming the UN Security Council. This year, silence. Whatever happened to that? To stand up to these ever-changing issues and challenges, the UN has to reform itself and adapt itself to the challenges. But the Security and Council only reformed the, the last time in 1965, Ambassador. But this That's is 45 years ago. But the Security Council is, you know, is part of the United Nations Charter, and to do a charter reform is not an easy thing. You know, this is a very subtle uh, setup, moderation, and as you, you correctly said, there is no consensus. There's a consensus, pretty much, that you have to reform it, but there's no consensus in which direction to go. Professor, if there is a will, there is a way. I had the sense that we were moving towards some kind of non-veto, 10-year term for states mm. like, I know the J Japanese have said publicly they oppose this, but, but in fact there was some movement there, such like Brazil, uh, India, that if we uh, took the veto off the table, but we went from these two-year terms, which strike me as too too short to really be effective, to something like a ten-year term, if that isn't ultimately the way we're, we were going. Ambassador uh, Brahimi, what's your take on the reforming the UN Security Council? You see, there again, I, I, you know, I have the views of an old man who can speak now. Maybe I'm wrong, but I believe that if the P5 really wanted to reform the Security Council immediately after 89, they would have done so. I think the atmosphere there was yes. ready. Everybody thought that you know, the end of the Cold War opened ways. And uh, I think that the P5 are very comfortable with the present situation. That is one. The second thing, uh, 
I think that the countries of the third world have a lot uh, to answer for. Uh, they are fighting amongst themselves. Every single group, Asia, Africa, uh, and Latin America, refuse to come up and say, look, these are our people that we want to, to be our... You mean as new permanent members yeah, at the yeah, Security Council? Yeah. Whether they, it's they India, disagree. South Africa, so Nigeria... They make, they make it very easy for the P5 to say, welcome, yeah. you know, we want the reform, but you don't want to. But this is what diplomacy is about. Yes. But Ambassador, diplomacy fact, is about finding solutions but, to very difficult but problems. But in fact, 90% of the UN Council's resolution passed with unanimity. Yeah. So there is some sort of a consensus. Why isn't things? Why aren't things getting better? Why aren't those things getting implemented? Well, this is of course a, a very subjective, subjective question. Why don't they get better? You know, it's uh, things are getting better, but not in a in a in an even way. The UN is able sometimes to react well to challenges, and sometimes it doesn't react that well. We do get consensus among 192 member states on many of the issues. The majority of the decisions and uh, resolutions are accepted or adopted by but consensus. But do you think, for example, it's, it's fair for France and the UK, two members of the European community, to have veto power in the United Nations? Exactly. One of those countries has a few days ago very strongly advocated change and reform the Security Council. So as I said, there is a consensus to reform it, but none of the options was able to command uh, this uh, consensus Professor, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're of the mind that unless it reforms pretty quickly, other international organizations will probably de facto replace it. Or perhaps some should be created to work parallel to or instead of the United Nations. Well, I wouldn't say replace. I think the UN is irreplaceable. It has a legitimacy. Uh, indeed, that's why we're debating this, because we want to strengthen the legitimacy of this institution. I would say more supplemented. And I would say that uh, the move from a G8 to a G20 is a good example of how other institutions might supplement the work of the UN. For example, to work on economic issues, you mean? For example, if you look at the history of the recent credit crisis, the UN was not the place that central bankers looked to as a forum for leadership and collective action. You know, this has been one of the biggest issues of global governance uh, in the last years. Uh, this. Uh, to combine the efficiency of a small group of 20 or 22 uh, with the legitimacy of the United Nations. But in the end, on many issues, many issues, you still need the world community to come together. The United Nations has been accused of corruption, of embezzlement, of sometimes here in New York, some went to trial for drug smuggling, for money laundering. There were also a question of sexual harassment. Ambassador, so many criticism about these organizations. First of all, how do you think it's faring on these questions and what should it do immediately to correct some of those problems? Uh, I think it is terribly unfair not to see that all in all, yes, there, are, there is corruption, there is misbehavior by people working for the UN, but all in all, I think there is much less of it in the United Nations than elsewhere. Sure. Uh, when you see what foreign troops do uh, when they don't have the, the, the blue helmet and you compare it to what they do when they do have the blue helmet, you will see that you know, it's the same people. But they behave better when they have the blue helmet. They do? Oh, of course, absolutely. When they wear the, the, the blue helmet, many of them, most of them, almost all of them, uh, feel some kind of added responsibility that's rather big. I mean, if I may say so, um, no Abu Ghraib happened in the in UN. But mission. the DRC happened uh, as well. I mean, the, well, the in the Haiti, DRC, the, yeah, well, sexual harassment women, sexual the use of children. Sexual harassment is individuals, it's mm -hmm. individuals that have committed. Uh, uh, where you can blame the UN is that they do not take strong uh, re repressive measures when these things happen. Uh, I think we, we, we should be able to take very, very strong corrective measures when things happen and demand that member states, you see, the UN has no prisons. They cannot put a soldier who has not behaved in prison. But there's a they, problem. They, they tell the, the member states, whether it's Austria or the United States or Algeria or anybody else, this man has done, please do something about it. And quite often they don't. I think this is a very, a very important point. Uh, 
And Abu Ghraib is a good example. Mm. Uh, Abu Ghraib was not exposed by journalists. It was not exposed by, uh, by the press. Abu Ghraib was originally exposed by an internal investigation. And if you don't have some kind of transparent uh, method for calling people to account, then you will have abuses just in the nature of the yeah. use of force. Yeah, but the uh, UN is much better than, in fact, than Kofi anybody Annan, else. Kofi Annan, oh. the former Secretary General, said, we're going to have zero tolerance. But there was zero prosecution. Yeah, but you see, he cannot prosecute anybody. What he can do is, uh, you know, tell Algeria or Kenya or, or and Indonesia or and the they United States that th they sometimes do, they sometimes don't. But I think what the minimum is that it, it, not enough publicity is given to these things. Yes. When, uh, when, when somebody from one country goes from DRC and is accused of having been involved in sexual harassment, you know, we should see in the press what happened to him uh, when he goes back. You think it's a question country. of branding? Uh, Marketing the UN? Bad public was, relations? It, no, it's not public relations. You know, I know that uh, uh, somewhere, I mean, let's not say where, somebody working for the UN miss, you know, uh, was rude to uh, uh, an airport official in that small, poor country. He was, you know, uh, uh, sent back home at that very minute. Yes. And I know for a fact that in that, in that mission, nothing like that happened again. No, it hurts, of course, when we see cases of corruption in the United Nations. But there are people working there. And uh, we, I also hope that we are less... Uh, we are less affected by that. Peace Professor, keepers. there are questions that are probably a bit more structural, institutional that I have problems with. Take, for example, the UN Council on Human Rights, the Human Rights Council. It's stacked with member states that are gross violators of human rights. And the second point is, you seem to think that all of this is inefficient. Maybe the so-called democracies should get together, and they're the ones who should take the lead on all these questions. What's your take? Well. I actually don't think an alliance of democracies could ever replace the United Nations because the UN embraces all the states of the, uh, of the earth. An alliance of democracies is an idea about the replacement of NATO, that, that NATO was a military alliance that faced a regional threat. Now the threats we face are global. And so instead of just having North Atlantic democracies, we would like to include all the democracies of the, Japan, South Africa, India, because the threats we face are no longer just those threats across the central front of Europe. But no, I don't, I don't think the Alliance for Democracies would ever replace it. What was supposed to be United for the Nations defense of Europe now is going to be for the defense of the world? Well, exactly. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And, and there are threats we have that are global threats. The proliferation of weapons of mass destruction is a global threat. I happen to think that many of the humanitarian disasters we see should be seen as global threats, whether they are man-made like genocide or, or ethnic cleansing, whether they are natural disasters like earthquakes or tsunamis. It doesn't bother you that some of these NATO members are some of the gross violators of international law, launching wars like in, in Iraq recently without UN mandate? I'm sure we disagree about this is on, the, on the law, but this is why I'm so much in favor of pluralism. This isn't the only voice for human rights in the world. There are many other institutions, even within the United Nations that speak out for human rights. So I'm not trying to sugarcoat this. The Human Rights Council has all the flaws that you say, but it's not the only voice. It's not the only thing the UN does. On this positive note, gentlemen, we're going to have to wrap up. Thank you for joining Empire, and I'll be back with a final thoughts. As soon as this UN session ends, the lobbying and the haggling will begin over who will be the next Secretary General. My personal favorite is the man who President Ahmadinejad and President Chavez consider a friend, and President Obama called my man. The trade unionists who led his country on the path of prosperity with phenomenal 80% popularity as he steps down this year. The international leader who helped create two of today's most influential international groupings, the certified southerner, social organizer, and unifier. After picking Two Secretary Generals from Asia, two from Africa, and four from the West, and only one from the Americas, my pick for effective, credible United Nations is the Latin American statesman, charismatic Brazilian President, Lula da Silva.
And that's the way it goes. Thank you for watching.